we've been uh, a couple of weeks in this uh, new series when everything goes wrong the adventure begins and um, today I asked Susie if she would focus on the praise side because um, the message today is about the train wreck inside and I didn't want to be so depressing <laughs> with all the needs and the prayer needs and everything and, and uh, so uh, I got afraid that you know we'd start out slow and taper off um, but I, I think it's really important when we look at our lives that we see that sometimes we do have a train wreck going on inside and, uh, and God speaks into that um, when I think about a train wreck uh, the fugitive you know the movie uh, every hen house, dog house, an outhouse. Well, there's that. It's probably one of the greatest scenes to me in all of cinema, and that's this train wreck. Because you think of a train just going off the rails, and that's it. But this thing went on and on and on. I was going to show it today to you, and then I thought, well, then we'd have to have an afternoon worship service for the rest of the <laughs> service. Because it really goes on and on, and you think, it can't get any worse. And then another car breaks loose, and, and more damage and disaster, and it just keeps going like that. And, and as I watch it, you know, I, I, sometimes I think of the church, but sometimes I think of that's what happens inside of, of me and inside of, of all of us sometimes. Um, one thing starts and then it leads to another and another, and we watch our, our lives uh, derail. Uh, in, in business, they call it a, a, a cascade effect where one thing happens like a waterfall and then it knocks something else which makes that go and that go and that go and pretty soon you're on this cascading uh, descent. And I felt that way sometimes. Um, the scripture I want us to, to look at today is uh, it's an amazing one. Now, Susie read for us in the prayer time, she read the Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord and he heard my cry and lifted me up. If you go just a little bit before that in the Psalms, you actually get a picture of what it was that was going on in his life when he was waiting patiently for the Lord to hear his cry and lift him out of the slimy mud, all that. So I want us to look at, at Psalm 38, um, starting in uh, verse 4. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I'm bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. Anybody relate to that? <laughs> and there's no health in my body. I'm feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. All my longings lie open before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart pounds. My strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. My friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbors stay far away. Those who seek my life set their traps. Those who would harm me talk of my ruin. All day long they plot deceptions. I'm like a deaf person who cannot hear, like a mute who cannot open his mouth. I become a person who does not hear, whose mouth can offer no reply. I wait for you, Lord. I wait for you. You will answer, my God. For I said, do not let them gloat or exalt themselves over me when my foot slips. For I'm about to fall and my pain is ever with me. I confess my iniquity, I'm troubled by my sin. Many of those who are my vigorous enemies, those who hate me without reason are numerous, those who repay my good with evil slander me when I pursue what's good. Lord, do not forsake me. Don't be far away from me, God. Come quickly to help me, O oh Lord my Savior. And it was from that context that in Psalm 40, he says, I waited for the Lord, and he heard my cry, and he lifted me out of the slimy pit and out of the mud and put my foot on a firm foundation. I think it's important for us to see what was going on. This is an incredible list of things, right? Now, sometimes in our life, it's obvious to people what's going on, and sometimes in our lives, it's not so obvious to others. Like, you notice he talks about, you know, the neighbors stay away because, you know, this might get on them, the stink will get on them. Or my friends, you know, they don't know what to do or say, so they just don't come around, you know. Um, 
But sometimes we can keep a good front up. You know, we can be sociable and up and, and a bit of whimsy, and, but then there's this inner reality going on too. Both realities are true. And, and I was reading in uh, uh, Kierkegaard's journal, well, Kierkegaard was, he's the father of existentialism, but he was a pastor, just a simple pastor, and, but he wrote journals every day. And uh, I've, I've asked Deborah to put it up on the screen. This is one of the great quotes of, I've ever found in my life. I have just now come from a party where I was its life and soul. Witticism streamed from my lips. Everyone laughed and admired me, but I went away. Yes, and the dash should be as long as the radius of Earth's orbit, and wanted to shoot myself. Is that a brilliant insight? How can you be the life of the party one minute, and then you leave the party, and you get home, and you want to kill yourself? How can that be? Now, I talked about this with my brother, the, the, the vineyard winery builder, uh, and uh, he, I left out the part about the dash as long as the radius, so he wrote me a big email about how that's really important, and, and don't forget to put that in. So Richard, I did put that in, okay? It's there. <laughs> Not that he would watch the video. But, uh, but so I talked to someone who's an expert at this um, this week, on Thursday. I was talking to Damien, <laughs> and, uh, and I said, how can this be? What does that mean? That you're the life of the party, and then you, when you went away, and it says the dash should be as long as the radius of the earth, and then you want to shoot yourself. And does that make any sense to you? And he said, oh, yes. Well, what is it? He said, you're the life of the party, and, you're, and everybody's laughing, and they love to be with you, and everything's great. And he said, it may only last for a second, but it feels like the longest time in history. But it's, it's the, with every step on the way home, you go, oh, why did I say that? and then shame, and then embarrassment, and then humiliation, and then guilt. And by the time you get home, you've gone into a suicide. And, and it may only be a short time in, in real time, but in you, it lasts forever, this transition that goes. And anyone who's struggled with being bipolar understands this. Uh, it seems like it's an instant, but in you, it's not. It's the whole world grinds to a halt and your whole reality changes. Now, I think that this is brilliant, and we, we can take it down, but the, because it's possible for us to appear one way to people and be another reality inside. But King David, and remember, this is the king writing this. This is a, an amazing uh, piece of history, and the church sang this. Is that weird? That, uh, I challenge you, Jeremy, to put this to music and we'll have an uplifting service. My wounds fester and are loathsome. Okay, let's sing to that. Um, so what happens is um, we, we have this mixture in our, in our lives. Let me can I use this. Is that all right with y'all? Should we vote? Now that we have members, <laughs> decide what I do. Um, say, say we have uh, uh, some emotional issues. Anger or fear or grief, uh, despair, any kinds of things. We, we have this emotional uh, turmoil, right? And that will affect how we think. We're not, we're not going to have thoughts and ways of approaching life that are different or are, are immune from what's going on inside us emotionally. You, you know that. It also affects our relationships. Like, like uh, the author of the psalm says, you know, my neighbors don't come around, my friends don't know what to do, and, and when we don't have the energy to get involved with people anymore on, on any level that, that means something, and, uh, and so we're, our emotions are turbulent, our thoughts are scrambled, our relationships are, are shredding, and this cannot help but, af but affect and impact our spiritual lives. How, you know, God, where are you? Or why did you do this to me? Or why are you letting this happen? Or why aren't you doing something now to intervene? And, and, and our spiritual life gets all into a corner. And then, you know what happens? It is not separate from our bodies, right? And so 
He talks about, you know, the aches and the pains and the weakness in his body and, his strength and, and uh, organ failure. All these things are starting to happen. I mean, you look at this and you're going, oh my gosh. Also, uh, I've got another one here. Uh, we, we, we have moral dilemmas in the middle of all of this. And, and choices that we make or, or we choose not to make. All of this turmoil. See, if you were laying on your side, this would look really normal to you. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, but um, you can lay there and look at it. Uh, but all of these dynamics create a, a turbulence inside of us. Now, now, here's the part I want you to see. It doesn't matter where you start, right? You can start with your emotions and affect your mindset. But what if you, what if you start here with uh, the way you think about something? What's going on in your mind? That's going to affect things all the way around. Or maybe you have a relational issue, or going through a divorce, or having problems with your kids, or something like that, or with your parents. That's going to affect, and, and or if you're having struggles in your spiritual life, that go, or in your body, your physical health is affecting you, and that affects everything. Do you get that? Yeah. It's an amazing thing. It doesn't matter what the issue is. It will lead, like a cascade effect, into these other things. And um, I was just stunned by, by looking at Psalm 38 this week and seeing the list of what's going on in the king. He starts out at verse 4, guilt overwhelms me. Guilt. The moral choice issue he starts with. He's guilty, and I don't know if it's false guilt or real guilt, but probably, he probably earned that guilt. And then he says, my wounds fester. So there's, there's physical problems or infection that's taken place in his body. And then, all day long I go about in mourning. He's in grief and mourning and loss. And then, you know, it jumps right from that to back pain. Um, yeah. I'll tell you what, when I'm upset about something or I'm feeling a great loss, I can, I can hardly get up from a chair sometimes. My back sees that. It's like, why is, why is grief and loss linked to back pain? I don't know. But it, but it was for David, and it is for me. Um, and then he goes, I'm so feeble. Just generally weak. Unable to, to have the strength to, to go forward. And then he says, and I have this anguish in my heart. This emotional anxiety. Anguish. And then he says, and some, some of us have had this, heart palpitations. He describes that. Isn't that weird? Heart palpitations. You know, like you get that in the middle of the night and all of a sudden your heart's beating and you're going, oh my gosh, what's happening? Am I having a heart attack here? And then he says, it affects my vision. How about that? The light's gone from my eyes. <coughs> and then his relationships. Friends avoid me. Neighbors stay away. The relationships are all affected by this. And then, get this, when we're at our most vulnerable, when all of this turmoil is taking place, this is so observant. What happens? The enemy circle. The people who have it in for us, they emerge. And then he says, um, it affects my hearing and it affects my speaking. He said, I'm so caught up in this turmoil that I, it's like I, I can't here and I can't respond. It just stops. Now, this is a really significant reality. If we're going to understand how God gets a hold of us and leads us forward in life, we have to be clear about what can happen in our lives and often what we're caught up in, whether we admit it or not. And, and be, and be uh, aware of that so that, so that we can be open. Um, I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, or maybe last week, from this little book, Rivers of Sorrow, Currents of Hope, by uh, Paula Darcy. Um, Jane wrote me this, and um, I wanted to share this with you. I'm sitting in a chair, listening for you, Lord. I want to know you. 
I want you to know me like I, I hold this cup of tea in my hands. Nothing makes sense, but I want you to be with me. I'm slowly letting go of being so right about things. I know now how much I don't know. Teach me how to let this sorrow change me. I want to find my way. And then she writes this. At first, I was too angry and afraid. The loss was too crushing. I wanted you to change my circumstances, but now I'm simply sitting here listening. Help me see things more clearly. Teach me about the human heart. I'll keep showing up with this teacup. You seem to be at work in life with a totally different purpose than the one I've been insisting upon. Now I'm sincerely trying to listen for your greater knowledge. I'm just showing up with this teacup. Lord, what do you have to say for yourself? I think that that is exactly what the psalmist is telling us here. It doesn't matter where we are on the <coughs> cascade effect. It doesn't matter what thing started it or didn't start it. it. And it does no good to try and unravel that and say, well, which came first and why did that? And if you hadn't done that, you know, I mean, we could go endlessly with that stuff. What matters is, are we willing to sit there and go, Lord, I'm listening. You have my undivided attention and I understand that sometimes you work differently than I wish you would. Here I am. I believe that it's at that here I am moment that God begins this transforming in us that literally picks us up and starts to rebuild us. And until we get to that, I'm here with my teacup, Lord, and I'm not leaving until I meet you. You know, until we get to that point, we just keep cascading. Well, it'll be different. You know, maybe it's a backache today and it's a shoulder ache tomorrow. Maybe it's a spiritual issue right now we battle with, but pretty soon it's going to affect our relationship. You know, it's all, all of that stuff. Now, have you noticed that, um, I'm not going to ask if you've ever been in one of these situations, you know, any of those, or any combination of them, but have you noticed that a lot of times the people around you don't get it? They really don't get it. Even when they pretend to care, you know, hey, oh, and how's that going for you? You know, and then you start to tell them and they walk away. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> well, no, I'm only on the third step of the cascade. I got much more to tell, you know. And, well, I think I'll go on over here to the party, you know, where it's not so, not so brusque. Um, well, I never understood that. I never understood why it is that when we're going through these kinds of issues, we feel like nobody gets it. And then I, I found this little book over in um, Holy Grounds, the coffee shop up there on 15th. I was meeting somebody there, and they were a little bit late, so I was looking at the books, and I found this, and I went, wow, God brought this to me. This is from Carl Menninger, a physician who founded the Menninger Clinics. And uh, this is his insight. When a trout rising to a fly gets hooked on a line, and finds himself unable to swim about freely, he begins with a fight which results in struggles and splashes and sometimes an escape. Of course, the situation is too tough for him. Now we have a master fisherman here. Neil, is that true? That's true. <laughs> they fight and struggle and splash and they're all over the place trying to escape and sometimes they do, but usually they don't. It's too tough for them. Then he says this, in the same way, the human being struggles with his environment and with the hooks that catch him. Sometimes we master our difficulties. Sometimes they're too much for us. The struggles are all that the world sees and it naturally misunderstands them. Now get this. It's hard for a free fish to understand what's happening to a hooked one. The free fish swimming around, around, what is their problem? Why are they acting like that? Why are they jumping around and jerking and fighting and going off in different... What's their problem? We're just swimming here, you know, minding our business. What is wrong with this one? 
And, and Dr. Minninger is saying that's what happens with us as people. And the ones who aren't experiencing the cascade right now or have pressed it down so they have no idea that it's really there happening to them, even while it does erode their life, they're thinking they're free. And they're looking at you struggling and fighting and trying to get free. And they go, what a nutcase. Why can't they just be like the rest of us? They don't understand. And they never will understand. And we shouldn't even expect them to. And we shouldn't even try and convince them about it. There's only one who understands when we've been hooked. And when we're fighting for our life and we're fighting for our freedom. There's only one. What's he saying here? I wait for you, Lord. And then verse 21. Lord, do not forsake me. Don't be far away from me. Come quickly to help. You're my Savior. Now in... Um, Joshua chapter 1. Uh, yesterday in the class, um, Jeremy was talking about uh, what's our one uh, our only confidence in life and in death is that we belong body and soul to the loving Savior. That's where we belong. We belong to the Lord. So I thought, where would that come from? And I looked here in Joshua chapter 1. And God's making this covenant with Joshua about, you know, you're going to lead the people and all those things. And then he says this. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. And then he says this. I will never leave you or forsake you. That is God's promise to us. I will never leave you or forsake you. Others might. All these things might happen. I am the only one who is going to stay with you because I understand the struggle. Jesus. John 16, 33. I've told you these things so that in me you can have peace. I didn't get that before this week. I thought he was saying, I've told you these things so you can have peace. But he's not. You can have peace in me. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In me you have peace. I think if we can grasp that, it doesn't matter where we are on the cascade. It doesn't matter because there's one there who said, I'm going to be with you in this. I'm going to be with you in this in the spiritual battle. I'm going to be with this in the physical battle, in the moral choices, in the thinking, in the relationships, in the emotion. It doesn't matter. I'm going to be with you and we're going to come through this and I'm going to give you a peace that the rest of the world has no idea how that works. That's my pledge to you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm going through this with you. And when we are at our very worst in the cascade, and I know some of your stories, you know some of mine, we've been there and we'll be there again. When we're in that very worst, we don't have to go home and shoot ourselves like Kierkegaard wanted to do. Because we're not alone and we're not forsaken. And there's hope. Because we can come out of this as God takes us from that very point where we say, Lord, I'm here with my teacup and I'm not leaving until I meet you. And, and he says, okay, I'm here, let's go. And it's at that point that we, and maybe it's a baby step, but we take that first step. We say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you with this. And I'm going to trust you with this. And I'm not going to let my uh, experience be dictated by my turmoil. I'm going to let you define my life. And we start to feel free for the first time. We have freedom that we never felt before. So that's it for today.
I don't have a big story to tell you. I just wanted to share that with you because I feel like it is really, really important that we don't lose touch and we don't pretend that the turmoil doesn't happen. But we never lose sight of the Lord who said, I will be with you and I will not forsake you and I will not leave you and I will give you my peace. So I say, let's meet him there and let's claim that. So Lord, here's our life. What it is, what it's been, what it might be, we just bring it to you, Lord, and we surrender it. And we say, Lord, whether we're on a victory run right now or we're in the bottom of the cascade, it doesn't matter. We surrender our life to you. And we say, Lord, have your way in us. And Lord, we claim your freedom today. We claim your peace that you've promised. We claim your hope. We claim your love when we feel unlovable. And we claim your protection when, when there are those who would erode us. Be our strength today. And be our Savior. In Jesus' name.